I'm Andy Chanley from 88.5 FM. This is our Here at Home video conference interview series. And today, I'm pretty stoked to welcome back in a friend of the station, Steve Earle, joining us today. How are you doing, Steve? Doing good, considering that I've been doing the same thing everybody else has been doing. I haven't been, I haven't been going anywhere. <laughs> and I've been, uh, you know, it's been, I, I can't complain because, I mean, for me, it was, I was in New York. I was in a play. It closed when everything else closed. Uh, then the next day, my son's school closed, and then the next day, the gym closed, and that was it. And I have a house in Tennessee, so we headed for Tennessee at that point. And uh, we've been here since March uh, 18th, I guess. And, um, you know, there's a pool there. <clears throat> there's I got a trampoline for my little boy, and, and I've been on it some. That's kind of fun. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's it, we could be in – there are people in way worse conditions quarantined than we are, you know, so it's hard to complain about it. But I'm supposed to be – you know, in there, we're, you know, talking to you in person as part of a promo, promo tour, like I nearly always do, and I release a record, and then I, I come see you, and then I go out to Amoeba, and, you know, it's like, it's yeah. one of those things, and then I head for, you know, probably San Francisco the next day, so, uh, and the record's coming out this week, and, and um, you know, we're going to do the best we can to make sure that people hear this record, because it's important to me, because it's, uh, it's about the people that the record's about. I want to make sure their stories get told. Well, let's talk about that real quick. The new album is called Ghosts of West Virginia. Like you say, it's uh, it's coming out uh, here in May. And uh, the single that you heard on 88.5 FM is Devil Put the Coal in the Ground. And um, let's bring up the people up to speed on the libretto for this this album. It's basically the soundtrack for an off-Broadway play, Coal Country. Right. And it was seven of the ten songs were written specifically for Coal Country, and I performed them in the show. Um, Jessica Blank and Eric Jensen, who I've known for some years, um, they do what they call documentary theater. And, and the idea is they, they, um, they did a thing called the exonerated. I was involved in it as an actor. It was uh, about death row exonerees, people who had been convicted of a capital crime and sent to jail for it and, and were eventually cleared and released. Um, they interviewed those folks and that became that show. They approached me because they wanted to do a show about an explosion that happened at a mine called Upper Big Branch in West Virginia 10 years ago this past April 5th. Um, 29 guys died that day. And they it was um, the first non-union mine on that mountain and a lot of safety regulation. Every safety regulation was being violated. The guys that worked there knew it, knew it was a time bomb. And uh, finally, the inevitable happened, and uh, um, um, some methane was ignited by poorly maintained equipment and poorly run equipment, and it killed 29 guys, and and, uh, several other guys were hurt. Um, And this is those guys, we we went to West Virginia. um, First, we had to find somebody that wanted to to get involved in this and make sure, uh, help us make it. you know, the, the Jessica and Eric called me because my music sort of lends itself to that, you know, a story about that part of the country to begin with. And number two, I talk like this. So <laughs> they, they, and they don't. So they, they, they felt more comfortable going to West Virginia with somebody. I, I was kind of the interpreter, too. But we um, <laughs> we just, um, you know, we went and, and met these people and talked to them. And, um, you know, they, they just want their stories told and, and uh, you know, what happened to their loved ones and why it happened. And it just, I've been looking for this. I've been looking for the project where I could make a record that spoke to people that maybe didn't vote the way that I did or, and, you know, and, and maybe for people that didn't vote the way I did. Because my opinion is, is that we're in really bad trouble right now because we've lost our ability to put ourselves in anybody else's shoes that lives any differently than we do. And mm-hmm. that's pe- very powerful people are capitalizing on that and getting away with literally murder. And and I think until this trouble that we're in in this country, I don't think we get out of it till we start trying to find a way to listen to each other and try to put ourselves in other people's shoes. So the idea was, um, you know, I, I did understand it because I, I go there and I play, but you know, it's not hard to figure out why people in West Virginia all voted for Donald Trump because Hillary Clinton went there and said she was going to close all the coal mines and Donald Trump went back 10 days later and said he wasn't going to. Right. That's how most people vote. And you can't 
you can't judge people harshly for that. Most people don't sit around, drink coffee and or whatever and talk about politics. Most people, politics to them are how it affects the way that they take care, their ability to take care of their family. And, and that's, you know, that's what this story w- is about, is about these people are, this was the most unionized place in America until very recently, and this was the first non-union mine on that mountain, and it exploded. And so mm. right there, there's common ground between people like me, lefties in New York City or Los Angeles, have with people in West Virginia, a belief that trade unions exist for a reason, that they're there to protect workers, not just about wages, but about safety and about making sure that the owners, you know, are kept honest about, you know, how they treat workers and the conditions that they work in. Sure, of course. You know, I'm I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Indiana, and I actually spent some time in uh, Kanawha County in uh, West Virginia. There, my sister was a chemical engineer at Union Carbide in in, wow. uh, in the '80s, and I, I've seen those communities. And what I think people uh, in bigger cities need to realize is that there are still a lot of kids running around barefoot in in West Virginia. In the, in there are, and, and and the only people, the other part of it that that I think was a revelation for me is the people that came in and opened these mines without a union. The only people that have anything are people that are working in coal, and they make good money. And they yeah. and they, and then when they came in to open these non-union mines. They paid people really well. It was comparable with union wages, but suddenly they were working 12 hours. Suddenly there was no lunch break. You didn't even sit down. You had your pop in one pocket and your sandwich in the other pocket, and you kept running the long wall, kept running that machine that was taking $600,000 worth of coal a day out of this mine when wow. it blew up. So it's a huge amount of money at stake. And these people take a lot of pride in what they do. Look, even if you grew up there and your father was a coal miner and your grandfather was a coal miner, some people go down there. This is three miles, an hour and a half on a man trip into the mountain to get to where this long wall was. And just think about that. Think about, you know, at what point do you, you know, I would get the boo-boo GBs and jump off the man trip and start running back up as I was yeah. for the line. So I could after about maybe, maybe a quarter of a mile. I think that'd be about all I could. Most people can't do this. And so they take a lot of pride in it. It's also the only people they say, see who have anything are people that work in coal. Yeah. You know, what's funny is uh, I was just thinking the other day, I was talking about this on the radio, the, the song um, Canary in a Coal Mine by the police. Right. Uh, it, it always sounded like one of those, you know, anachronisms, one of those things from way back when they used to take a canary down there. So the canary, right. if it keels over, you know, there's too much uh, carbon monoxide or other, you know, uh, mine gases that, that will kill humans and you got to get out of there. Mm-hmm. I just read they, they didn't stop using canaries until 1986. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, it still to me happened. Yeah, it st- that, still did happen. Yeah. This is the kind of thing in, in 2020, we're still going into a hole to get a rock to burn. It, it, was that something that, you know, uh, that you thought about as you know, putting together these songs and, and talking about sure. the of these people? Sure, but, but a couple of what's interesting about this particular place before, and that's the point where people that think like I do go, oh, well, those people shouldn't be taking that stuff out of the ground anyway. It's messing the air up and da, da, da. Number one, this coal was not going into coal fire electricity plants. It was going, it's steel making coal super. That's why the union still, you know, was, had power in West Virginia long after the mining unions had no power left in Kentucky and the other places and around the coal mining areas because it was steel making coal. Now we do not make steel in the United States of America. It's all being packed up and shipped off someplace where they do make steel and a lot of money being made. So it's not, um, it's, it's, it's not, um, the problem is we all go to Walmart or wherever we go and we buy the products that are made with that steel yep. and we use the electricity that's generated by the coal fire plants. And we're all part of that. And, and, and you can't go into West Virginia and say, Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And you, or you should feel bad about doing that because you know, it's messing the air up when you don't have anything else to offer them and when you're using the products that are made of that steel and using the electricity that's generated by that coal, we, it's a huge collective 
decision has to be made that we're going to do something different when it comes to energy in this country and this world. And we're not there yet. It's chess. It's not checkers. And in the meantime, you're not going to find any allies in doing that as long as you treat it. This is like, it's equivalent to spitting at guys that came back from Vietnam and calling them baby killers when they came back. Cause they went because they were sent there because, and the only people that got sent there were poor people and, and they had no choice, but to go very few people made the decision to go to Canada or not to go. Most people just went because they were raised to believe that's what you do when you're called. And, and, you know, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their policy that was causing what we did in Vietnam. It's the same thing. These guys are just, they're trying to take care of their families and they're doing the only thing they know that to do in the part of the world they live in where anybody ends up with anything, any chance of sending your kid to college, any chance of being, of having health care when you, when you get ill, you know, uh, coal's the only way anybody has that in West Virginia. Well, the song, uh, devil put the coal on the ground is, uh, it's it's uh, it's hypnotic. It's uh, you know it it, it almost uh, it has a, a mythic quality to it. And I was interested to see that you recorded this in mono. And I figured it was oh that's him making an artistic choice to uh, you know to have this uh, you know be you know like it would have been recorded in Sun Records uh, you know sixty five years ago. Uh, but but actually there's a different reason why you went mono in there. Well, for one thing, Mono go, goes, you know, doesn't go back quite that far because none of us heard Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band in stereo. You know, probably, you probably never heard it in stereo until it came out on CD. It existed, but most of us got it in mono, and those were the mixes the Beatles intended for us to hear. They didn't care about the stereo mixes. I think the first band that ever cared about their own stereo mixes was probably Pink Floyd. You know, and, sure, and, sure. and but, Jimi but, Hendrix did. Jimi Hendrix did too. But mono, um, I like. As it turned out, I love the way the mono sounds, and and I'm glad it. But I'm deaf in my right ear, completely and totally stone deaf in my right ear. I woke up the day after Willie Nelson's Fourth of July picnic last summer in Houston, and uh, I just noticed that something felt strange in my right ear, and I plugged up my you know left ear, and I couldn't hear anything out of it. It's called since it, it is. I thought, oh well, I finally just you know been playing this stuff too loud and finally hurt myself. And uh, I've been on ear monitors for years though, and and hadn't really been taking a hit that way. And uh, but I went. We were we had one more show to do in Louis. We did Houston. We went to Louisiana for one show, and then we were deadheading to go out to Martha's Vineyard. So I went to Boston Eye and Ear, which is the best place that does that in the country. And it was diagnosed as sensorineural sudden deafness. And it's a, they think it's caused by a virus, but the head of the department admitted to me, well, when we don't know what it is, we usually say it's a virus. <laughs> and so they don't know. They've never isolated a virus. They think that might be what it is. But it happens. Sometimes steroids collected. I had a bunch of shots in my eardrum and uh, a series of them as the tour continued, and it never came back. And, and I'm, so I can't hear in stereo you have to have two ears to hear in stereo that's how it works that's what it's right. emulating is 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 this is the you know what you're what the the problem what you miss from it is some more than music is when somebody speaks to me and they're standing behind me i don't know which direction it's coming from and that right. can be a little strange sometimes I, my little boy um, you know, I'll get off in a part of the house and I don't know where he is because I can't, I have no sense of direction der derived from hearing anymore because of the loss of the hearing in one ear. So I decided the only way, I guess I'm retired from producing other people's records because I don't see how I responsibly could mix anybody else's record now. You know, I just don't feel qualified to do that anymore. But uh, my own records, the the we just I said, well, look, let's just do it in mono because I'll be able to tell something about that. It's going to sound the same, you know, in my one working ear as it would. And, and we did it, and it actually sounds pretty damn good. It sounds I amazing. Like it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough, and it's it's uh, you know, <clears throat> drums kind of pop, and and without uh, making them too loud, and uh, without them interfering with the lyrics, it's a weird, and you know. Phil Spector, you know, uh, for all the other trouble he got into, he used to ground with a button for a long time. Said, said back to mono. He wore yeah. it for years. So. <laughs> um, you know, when I, I uh, heard this song the first time, "A Devil Put the Coal on the Ground," um, it, it, it actually popped in my head. Uh, you know, uh, 
Mr. Peabody's coal train. I was thinking about uh, uh, John Prine and Paradise. Right. Well, this, uh, this mine actually belonged to Peabody Coal, which was a union company until 1994. How about that? They, they sold it to Massey Energy, which was the first non-union operator on the mine, but it actually had belonged to Peabody wow. before that. Wow. Yeah. That's a, I, I had no idea about that connection. Yeah. Um, this nasty disease, uh, it, uh, it took John Prine from us. And I, I just saw that you were going to play his All the Best Fest in November before we knew our lives would be all turned upside down by this stuff. I have my reasons for sure, and other people do, but uh, you knew the man. Yeah. Could you, could you tell everybody why John Prine was such a giant? Yeah, he's, he was, um, you know, uh, like I said, I've, I, I, I've met, um, you know, um, I've been lucky enough to meet most of my heroes and, and only two have been assholes so far. So that was, I feel pretty fortunate. And <laughs> Prime was definitely not one of them. And, um, when he moved to Nashville, I was already here and, um, I'll never forget. I was playing a solo show, which I, I was smart enough to, cause I kind of came from being a folk singer that even after guitar town came out and I was finally successful after beating around here for a long time and touring with the band, I knew that to know I had songs, I needed to go out and play solo shows in between the band tours. And I was doing a show at Vanderbilt university, one of the smaller auditoriums there. And John turned up at the show and I was like, I knew his brother, Billy, cause he had had a, he had had a rockabilly band around town at the same time I did. But, uh, it was just, it was just a big deal to me because, you know, those records, every single one of them, you know, as they came out, um, they, I mean, I bought them and I, I was already, you know, I knew Towns Van Zandt, I knew Guy Clark and, and uh, by the time I was, you know, 18, you know, I knew Guy, I met Towns when I was 17 that guy when I was 19, but Prime first record came out the year I dropped out of high school. He was sort of the last guy that I didn't, you know, that came from out there somewhere that, that, that I, that I heard every record from the, from the beginning to the end. And then for some reason, bruised orange kind of became my John Prime record. I don't know why, just a point in my life. I listened to it on somebody else's couch and, um, you know, I just love that record. And, and, uh, he, he was incredibly nice to me. Uh, we did um, this concerts for a landmine free world that Emmy and I used to do. Uh, John was on the European um, uh, version of that tour at one point, and we got to spend a, a lot of time together during during that run. He was a, he was a funny guy, man. He was just a great, great, great songwriter, and and just the the people tried to do it, and they don't often pull it off. That idea of how he could get that kind of you know humor and pathos into the same line. That, yes. that that's what he did better than anybody and every there's songwriters come around and, and try to emulate it all the time and then mostly they just end up with smart ass songs and yeah. it's not the same thing my sister was just telling when i you know i was grieving about uh, losing him I, that one really hit me and uh, i had never met him but she said you know i was listening to an npr show um about 10 years ago and i heard him on there i wasn't familiar with his music but by the end of it i was captivated i was mesmerized and i just thought you know what i'm gonna write him an email and i sent him an email he answered back the next day and yeah. said hey I, thanks I, for I, that I, no trouble believing that and we are gonna do uh, all the best is gonna happen in may we're gonna do it as a as a, as a memorial for john and so um and i will be there awesome Good, good, good to hear. It, it's been kind of a shitty year for you. I know you lost your bass player, uh, Kelly Looney, of uh, some 30 years, um, six months ago. Um, you know, you, you yeah, have to lost, set these lost goals. Lost Prine, and, Prine and, and Hal Wilner in the same day. And Hal was a great record producer, and he produced West, uh, uh, you know, Lucinda's record, and, and he's done... You know, he's, he used to be, he was the guy that did the music for the skits on Saturday Night Live for years and years, and he was a friend, and, and um, lost them the same day, and that was tough. That was the first people I knew that, 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 that we lost in the middle of all this. How do you keep your chin up through, through all of this? Is it goal setting of things that are coming up? Because I know it's probably, you can't do your songwriting camp this fall in person and all of these things. What, what do you we, do? To, we, haven't to decided, we haven't canceled uh, Camp Copperhead yet. Don't get ahead of us. Uh, we, we might. Um, we'll see. It's September. It's a lot can happen between now and then. I don't think you're going to see. I'm not going to tour until next year. I don't. I'm, I think that's a done deal. Um, nobody's going to tour this summer. Um, it's maybe outdoors not, is the way to go with the the camp because they say it's a little harder to. to a pass lot this of it takes kit place in pretty open air situation anyway because the camp is a camp. It's not. It's an old dirty dancing style 
um, you know, like Catskills <laughs> camp that, that some, some guys that some, some, some really cool guys bought and they do music camps there for the most part. They do weddings on the weekend and music camps during the week all summer long. And uh, I do a camp there. Uh, Richard Thompson does a camp there. There's a prog rock camp there. Everybody that's ever been in in in, in uh, King Crimson except for Robert Fripp is involved. And it's uh, it's just uh, a lot of music just in the in the rocks and the water there because that's been going on there for all these years. And um, we, we'll we'll try to do it. I don't know that we'll be able to do it. Uh, you know, if if uh, the Outlaw Country Cruise goes out, and right now it's scheduled to go out at the end of January, I'm going to be on the damn boat. And, nice. you know, it's we're going to get back to live music. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to wear a mask, and I'm going to wear gloves when I'm supposed to, when it's suggested by scientists, you know, who I believe that, that I should do it. I'm going to continue to do it because you don't wear the mask to protect you, man. You do it to protect other people because this thing – we, there's a lot we still don't know about it. And my mom's 84 and, and on oxygen already, so that's why I wear a mask. And and um, I just uh, we'll see what you know we'll see what happens. But I think we're going to be. I think there's a really good chance Coal Country will go back up when theaters open in New York because the set's still there, and um, and we we want to. That's our intention. There's some ducks that have to line up for that to happen but that's our intention and i think after that i'm going to continue i'm going to go back out on the road next summer and i will still be supporting ghosts of west virginia because i want to make sure these people's story gets told that's what i set out to do and i'm not going to stop until i do it well once again the the album is uh, called ghosts of west virginia as you hear this interview it's already out and you've heard the song already on 88.5 fm devil put the coal in the ground uh, I, I always enjoy talking to you steve i, I feel like I'm, I'm talking to a a, a genuine um a real human being and and definitely a, an accomplished artist so thanks for giving us time today for this thank you i appreciate it and thanks for putting a couple of images in my mind uh, that I'm not going to forget soon. That of Steve Earl at a, a dirty dancing uh, style camp and you on a trampoline. Those are yeah, the trampolines a trip now. <laughs> for one thing is about to get the trampoline image in your head correctly is I've lost 46 pounds since you saw me last. Yeah, you're looking I, good. I got, you're looking diesel. I got really serious about it. About the time when I was in L.A. to play um, the Troubadour last summer, uh, after that show, Billy Gibbons and Earl Brown and I went to Tommy's after that show, and that was the last time I ate late at night. And I've been eating one meal a day, and I kind of stepped the exercise up, and I'm down to 199 pounds, man. I'm going to be nice. fighting weight when you see me again. <laughs> All right. I'll be forewarned. Um, thanks for joining us uh, t this afternoon, uh, Steve. We'll see you next time, like you say, when you get to town. Until then, uh, be well and, uh, and be safe, and we'll talk to you soon here on 88.5 okay. FM. Thanks, man.